first item on the agenda is to welcome all of you that are here. And we do have a quorum. In fact, we've got uh, a solid quorum. <laughs> So <clears throat> thank you very much for coming. We'd like to thank those folks that are in the gallery for coming to uh, join us and, and watch us perform. <laughs> so welcome to, uh, to all of you, and uh, let's move right along. Item number two on our agenda, and that is uh, the approval of the minutes for the April 29 Agency <coughs> Operations Committee meeting. So I assume you've all read those in great detail. Okay, we have a motion. I make a motion to approve the minutes. And a second. Motion by Brenda, second by Bob. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Now I'd like to call on Arturo. No, excuse me. I want to back up a second. Uh, we have guests here today from KPMG that have been doing some audit work for us. And you folks have all heard me say before, we like to put them at the front of the line because the clock is running. <laughs> so having, having said that, uh, we'd like to uh, go ahead and, and if it's okay with the committee, go ahead and put them next on the agenda. Is there any opposition to moving them up on the agenda? If not, then we will do that. So <clears throat> what we'd like to do is uh, this agenda item under auditing is consideration of approval of an internal audit report on financial aid and enrollment audit of Houston Community College. The report was uh, sent to you under separate cover by Tony Tigby, Director of Internal Audit. I'd like now to turn the uh, over yes. to Tony. I think I read the wrong one. They're out of order. Excuse me. Yeah, I've got it. Okay. Excuse me. My error. The next item on the agenda is adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the committee regarding approval of the report on audits of agency loan programs and agency-wide financial statements for fiscal year ended August 31 of 08 by KPMG LLP. This report was provided to you under separate cover by Tony Tigby. And here to present the report is Tony. Rebecca Goldstein, Audit Manager at KPMG, and Dee Niles, Concurring Audit Partner at KPMG. Tony and Dee. We lost Tony again. <laughs> okay. You can Very come good. up here, Tony. <laughs> I'm just reading my script. That's right. <laughs> That's part of performing, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> so he has to come up and be participating. Okay, so the ball's in your court. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do is you did you did receive three different reports. You should have a report that's called Report on Internal Controls and Auditing Procedures. You should have a report that's called Report to the Board and then the Financial Statements. What we're going to do is we're going to do a PowerPoint that summarizes all three of these so we're not flipping between the three reports. Uh, but if you need more detail, they're going to be in those individual ones. So you see on page two of the PowerPoint presentation, the agenda, we're going to cover internal control deficiencies. Uh, audit adjustments, significant accounting policies, management's judgments and estimates, and then any other matters that I'm required to communicate to you. Uh, management's responsibilities on slide three uh, talks about what management has to do for an external audit. Uh, adopting sound accounting policies, establishing and maintaining internal controls. Uh, it's their responsibility to present financial statements fairly. It's our responsibility to audit those and then comply with all the requirements of laws and regs. KPMG's responsibility when we come in as external auditors on page four is that we express an opinion on those financial statements that management creates with your guidance. Uh, our opinion is reasonable, not absolute, so I have to verify that. We look at material items, we do sampling, so we don't look at every item in the financial statements. Uh, we do do the audit in accordance with the professional standards. We communicate, which we will do today, all the required communications that uh, the standards require. And then we also uh, want to make sure that the audit doesn't relieve management of their responsibilities. In other words, they do things, we audit, it doesn't make it our fault, it would be both. But everything is in really good shape. Uh, you're flipped to start on slide five, and that's where we're going to start the audit results. And I just want to start the conversation by talking about this year and this year's audit. 
it was an extremely good audit. Things improved dramatically. Significant areas that actually had improvement you can see, and we'll go over those, are controls. We had a few deficiencies, but not what we've had in the past, and not to the magnitude. Uh, fewer adjustments, and again, smaller dollar amounts. Um, so it's in a lot better shape. And the coordination of the audit went a lot better this year. Um, we really set out the lines of who's doing what, when it has to be done, and both management and KPMG worked well together to get that done. And we are within budget this year of the audit. So timeline and budget-wise, we came in. So that is extremely good news to all of you. So we want to commend management and staff this year on the work that they did uh, and, and to really say thanks. And they've really improved quite a bit. So I have to require, uh, I'm required to do the internal control deficiencies. There was three deficiencies. There was no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. Um, and so that is really good. So they're just minor deficiencies that we wanted to share. Uh, the first one was access privileges for developers. Um, we found that and it was mitigated in June of 2009. Management corrected it early. The next one was cash reconciliations. Um, they're being performed and the reconciled items are being tracked, but they're not getting corrected in a timely manner. So literally it's just a timing matter. Uh, when we brought that to uh, the attention of management, they corrected that in August. So again, they corrected it as soon as they found it, which is good. And then the last one, there was a cruel method for payments. Uh, kind of using the appropriations versus the true gap when you do the accrual. So there was an adjustment made and it actually decreased the accrual this year. Uh, so it made the balance sheet and income statement look better. Uh, because what they're doing is they were taking appropriations and figuring out the accrual versus actual expenditures. So those are the three areas. Again, not significant deficiencies, not material weaknesses, just deficiencies. Uh, audit adjustments are going to run along the same line. Uh, the adjustments, uh, we had no uncorrected adjustments, and I'm sure Susan has talked to you in the past about there's kind of two levels of adjustments. There's corrected and uncorrected. Uncorrected, we audit to a fairly low level and track those because we want to aggregate them then at the end of the audit and say, if you put them all together, is it material? We had none of those smaller dollar ones that we tracked. Uh, and then we did have some corrected ones, and if you go to your report to to the board in the back of that would have every entry uh, that was made. And so, but we didn't consider any of those entries to be material or for it to be cause big issues in the audit. We tracked them to make the report materially correct. Um, and so we did do the adjustments. We The allowance for doubtful accounts, there was actually just a mathematical error in that. We did not consider it a control issue. Just math didn't work out, so that was corrected. Um, we reduced the accounts payable, which we talked about on the control deficiency in the last page. And then reconciled items for the cash account, we made an, uh, an adjustment for that, which we talked about on the control deficiency. So on page 8, what I have to communicate to you as the board is um, significant account policies are in note 1 to the financial statements, which you guys have a copy. There were no significant changes to those account, uh, accounting policies in the fiscal year of 2008, which is the year we audited. Uh, page 9, estimates. We do look at management's estimates. When you pick up a set of financial statements, every set is going to have some sort of estimate in it, whether it's allowance for a doubtful account, whether it's setting up your useful lives for your, your capital assets, you know, whether it's accruals in some way. So they all have estimates. We did consider the allowance for doubtful accounts for loans and related interest as a significant estimate. We did look at that and agreed with uh, management's determination of what that is. And then the last page, you just see there's a smattering of other matters like disagreements with management, written communications, those type of things that we're required to communicate. So we summarized it on one page to basically tell you we had no issues with any of those. Instead of going through each one individually, they're all okay. Um, I know I did that really quick. I know you guys are running a little behind schedule. <laughs> and even though I'm an Oklahoma girl, I can talk really fast. <laughs> sometimes the draw will get in there. Sometimes it won't. Uh, but Susan wanted to apologize for not being here, but she did have a trip scheduled for over a year with her family. And she's in the middle of the sea right now, or else she would have called in. So good for her for taking some vacation. Um, and so I'm going to open it up to questions, any concerns, or any other comments. Did you uh, did you 
state the top bullet point on page seven, which was the you know I thing probably really wanted to hear. I probably didn't, but you know what? You have an unqualified opinion, <laughs> um, which is a clean opinion, which is a good opinion, and you know it, it was a it really was a good year. Uh, I have been involved with the coordinating board for three years as the second review partner, so I've kind of went through the trials and tribulations uh, and all the phone calls of you know this control didn't work, how are we going to approach this, that type of thing. So it was a good year, just from even me sitting on a little bit of the outside looking in. Just wanted to hear you say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unqualified. It's an unqualified opinion. <laughs> Well, I'd put it mildly to say that's music to our ears, because some of us were here to remember that first audit three years ago, and uh, you uh, and the staff have really done a tremendous job since then. We thank you, and please give Susan our regards. I'm sorry that we missed her, but I'm sure she's having a lot of fun where she is. Uh, there's one thing that I wanted to do, and I'm not sure that we can do it just yet, but maybe we can, um, Mary Lou. I would like to uh, congratulate the team of employees who made this uh, audit uh, from the staff possible and uh, give them some recognition for the good work that they did. And back here on the screen, you can see all the names and so forth. And everybody there made a significant contribution to this good, clean audit. And if we want to keep it this way as we go into the future. This is, this is really good work on everybody's part. And personally, I'd like to thank you, and I'm sure this committee does. Yeah. Okay, now we'll go back to the agenda, and I guess it's you folks are hey, that was easy. ready to go. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> if you hurry, we'll say a little more. <laughs> <laughs> so you can take it tomorrow. Yes, I am. But we don't need them to take it. No, no, no. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just want to get the clock to stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd like to uh, address the committee now. You've heard uh, the report, and uh, are there any questions at this point? If not, may I have a motion to approve the report? So moved. Moved by Fred. Second. Second. Second by Brenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Now we'll go back, take a step backwards, and we'll get a deputy commissioner's report. And I'd like to call on Arturo to introduce the topic for this meeting, and uh, he will give us some background information, introduce the presenters. This item requires no uh, action. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The deputy commissioner's report for this quarter is divided into four parts. Uh, as noted in your agenda. I will present two of those reports, uh, the facilities update and the report on the license plate program that you had asked me to bring forth. Uh, Mr. Brill France is here to present the report on the increase of the V&E contract that, that happened during the last, uh, the last quarter. And then uh, I will also come back and, and present uh, or make a very, very brief remarks on the uh, quarterly financial report uh, that I have been working on with the ad hoc committee. Uh, on the facilities update, uh, I'd like to tell you that I think everybody's aware that our lease expires in June of 2010, about, about a little bit less than a year from now. And we have been working with the Texas Facilities Commission on our space needs in trying to identify uh, what, what the next step is and where we're going to end up uh, in a year. We started this about a year ago and have been uh, the steps have been uh, very, uh, a lot of steps involved, but it's, they've been very amicable with the TFC, uh, and, and the steps have been very methodical uh, in our approach. One of the things that worked in our favor this year, or this time around, is that we were able to enlist the expertise of C.B. Richard Ellis, which is a real estate uh, development company, a uh, huge development company. And uh, they brought their expertise to the, to the table, and, and we've been able to avail ourselves of, the, of, of their expertise. Uh, as we started out, and I've kept the committee in, uh, informed throughout, uh, throughout the process, but when we started out looking at uh, where, what our considerations were, we wanted, obviously, if we can, a more centralized location. Uh, we had to take into consideration that the cost for that centralized location, or wherever we end up with, uh, would be within our current funding profile. 
Uh, we want to make sure that we take into consideration the safety of our employees and trying to improve the working conditions for, for everybody. Um, we found out that even though the real estate market is depressed nationwide and maybe even in Austin, uh, it is not so much so in the Central Business District. Uh, we also found out that while there is a large or a high vacancy rate throughout the Metroplex, um, it's, it's difficult to find 60,000 square feet. Most of it is broken up into 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 feet. Uh, it's difficult to find 60,000 square feet that would be contiguous and that would meet our needs. Uh, and then the third thing that we found out is that um, while the, uh, the, the, as I said, the vacancy rate is high, most of the the high vacancy rate is out towards the uh, the suburbs. So that countermines what uh, uh, what one of our objectives was to try to find a centralized uh, site for 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 our place. Um, from the uh, from from all the steps, we uh, working with CBA Richard Alice and T Texas Facilities Commission. Uh, we identified nine potential vendors. Uh, we tour eight of those vendors. Uh, the ninth we did not tour because it's the present building. Um, CB Richard Alice and the Te Texas Facilities Commission solicited uh, uh, proposals from from all uh, from the sites. Four of them came in with detailed proposals. Uh, they went back and requested what they call a best and final offer, and that is where we sit today. Uh, CB Richard Alice and the Texas Facilities Commission are working with the last four to negotiate the best deal. Uh, and the, the last four that are still interested uh, are working with, with our, our, our staff. Uh, well, we're working with them and uh, <coughs> trying to, uh, to see if we can come up with a very good deal uh, for the coordinating board. Uh, we um, have recommended uh, to to the court, uh, to the uh, facilities commission, that they enter into negotiation with one vendor and one alternate, and depending on what the outcome is, we expect to hear some uh, final uh, results by the end of this week. Uh, we should be able to uh, make our recommendation to to the Texas Facilities Commission. So that's where we are. I, I would be glad to uh, answer any questions, but uh, we're we're making progress. We hope that we will have a building and that we will not be under bridge, the bridge of uh, 35 and I 183 a year from now uh, asking for uh, donations of the traffic that passed by there. Um, that, at least that's my objective. Uh, so I, I, I would be glad to answer any questions on that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, or members of the, of the board. You've answered a lot of our questions already. Okay. <laughs> okay, is there any further discussion? There was no action on that item, so we'll move on to the next one unless somebody has something else to talk about. The next report that you asked me to bring forth, uh, Mr. Chairman, is uh, you wanted to uh, get an update on the College for All Texans license plate program that was launched, uh, oh, I guess about a year ago or, or more or less, uh, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, a soft launch. It was a very soft launch, <laughs> yes. Um, are the results just as soft? Yeah, and the results are just as soft. Uh, there is, uh, this is one of those good news, bad news. Uh, the, and, and I think, and I, and I mean this seriously, uh, the good news is that we have not spent, as the board requested, uh, and the commissioner uh, uh, made very clear to us, that we not spend any funds on, any state funds, on marketing the license plates. Uh, also, that's the good news. The bad news is that the sales have, have been uh, consistent with uh, and reflective of the economy uh, that we find ourselves in. Uh, to date, uh, as everybody knows, the uh, plates cost $30. Of those $30, $22 come back to the CB to fund scholarships. But today we have sold uh, approximately, this is uh, it's about a week ago, 52 plates uh, for a total contribution of just under $1,600 that have come to the coordinating board. Um, I don't have to tell you that uh, the timing, uh, and it was, uh, I mean, it was just unfortunate, but uh, coincided with probably one of the worst, not probably, but the worst economic downturns that the country has ever seen. Uh, but the commissioner has also put a moratorium on any further expenditures, uh, kind of wanted to ride the, 
the wave here and see where, where we end up uh, with our economy. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that's that's the bottom line. Uh, Commissioner, I don't know if he wanted to add anything on that, but I mean, that's that's where we are. No, I, I think you're right. Uh, we, uh, you'll recall, we uh, uh, started getting into plates uh, last uh, July, and then uh, the economy tanked about two or three months later. We had uh, we had some ideas about if we were going to meet with the uh, uh, car dealers association, and uh, uh, so we just we just stopped everything, uh, and uh, we will we'll wait until the economy starts uh, coming back, and then. Uh, we will uh, probably, uh, we will not probably, we'll seek outside funding to uh, market the license plate and go on from there. But uh, I, I, I directed the staff that we would not spend uh, any money on this until uh, the economy got stronger. Okay. Any questions, comments? Okay. The next wrong? report is uh, uh, the quarterly financial report. That you have that you received in your packages that, that went out uh, two weeks ago, uh, as, as and I think all of you were there this morning. Bob, uh, Bob, Mr. Wingo was not, but uh, Brenda made mention of this uh, this morning. Uh, this is a report that she and Lynn, as the ad hoc committee that the chairman uh, appointed, uh, to look at redoing the quarterly financial report that comes to the board. Uh, what you have before you is a uh, what I would call a prototype or a model that, that Brenda and, and Lynn uh, think may work for the board. Uh, this, is, as she mentioned this morning, is not the final product, but uh, it's, it's going in the direction that I think will provide the information that the board uh, needs to, uh, to be kept informed on the financials. Uh, Brenda, I uh, don't know if you want to make any further comments on that, but uh, uh, we'd be glad to answer any questions on that. No, the, the timing is such that we couldn't get it in more of a final form before this meeting, but nevertheless, you can kind of see the direction we're headed. We are going to pare it back uh, several pages, so you'll see a, a new version um, soon. Of course, please give us all of your comments and feedback as we work. This is a work in progress. Um, Somewhat, so. so if, if anybody has any questions or any uh, comments uh, at any time, I just yeah. send me an email and we'll, we'll, we'll be glad to, uh, to answer your questions. Yeah, and the ultimate goal here is when, when we get to a near final version, um, it's going to be programmed in such a way that it will be an automated report. So it will not, it will take staff time up front again to get the programming done. But after that, it should be an automated process. Good to go. Very good. And our goal was sort of a um, financial reports for dummies. That's why they had me on the committee. <laughs> so, <laughs> so look at this, and if it doesn't pierce the veil, yeah. let us know. Well, <laughs> I did. That was the idea. There's no misspellings anywhere. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes, we did have a few little. <laughs> You should see how I scrub through my emails before I send them to her. I know. Exactly. No, but that's, that that's why we have a, that's why we have probably more information. We started with more is better kind of scenario, especially with uh, you know new board members coming on in a few months, etc. But we've we have learned um, since the issuance of this report how to how to pare it down and make it a little more user friendly. So. Brenda did a great job. I, I really understand it for the first time. So. It's wonderful. Any other discussion, comments? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. I just want to, um, I know Fred and I spent some time looking at this with Lynn and Brenda. Actually did all the work, okay? Not, not during the work. And I just want to commend you all because it really is, it really allows you to track the funds. And, um, and I mean, I think this is kind of evidence of the, the value that Brenda brings many things to the board. But she has shown us every way you can look at this okay and um, and but it's it's really good because it allows us to not just look at our budget but looks allows us to look at the trustee budget and uh, and that was a goal to have some transparency in the sense of understanding as opposed to looking at what our historical reports have looked like so I, I commend both you and Lynn and the folks in the agency that worked on it and I look forward to the uh, it'll be good timing uh, for the next month because obviously we'll have some new board members to help them to understand a little bit better. So. Very good. Any other discussion? 
<clears throat> I just have a comment here, and I hope that I don't offend my friends in the academic community. But uh, this is starting to look like a business. <laughs> and uh, from best I can tell, it's going to look like a, a real good business before yeah. it's over with. Thank you very much, friends. You've done a great job, and Lynn says we really do appreciate it. Okay, next item on the agenda. Uh, one, one more report, okay. uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, that um, during the, since the last uh, quarterly meeting, uh, we had to uh, execute under the board's emergency procedures or emergency rule uh, an amendment to the uh, V&E contract, uh, our bond council, and uh, Mr. Ryder asked Bill to uh, uh, update the, the full committee on, on what uh, on what that was, and so, uh, Bill. Uh, good afternoon. The uh, V&E contract was capped at $500,000. I am advised that certain opportunities presented themselves to the coordinating board to save the state a not insignificant sum of money by by proceeding to engage in remarketing of several series of our bonds but in order to do so we would need to increase the cap and so as a result we increased the cap from 500 to 600 thousand dollars and that this contract expires on August 31 this year and Patrick Krishak is here. He's our senior financial analyst. If you all have any questions about the savings that were uh, available to us, but we will also be discussing uh, bond council in closed session at the end of the committee meeting as well. If there's any questions, I'd be pleased to to take them on. Any questions? Discussion? I'm trying to find on my sheet any reference to V&E. That's in the Deputy Commissioner's Deputy Commissioner's report there. Uh, on the first page. On the very first page? Okay, well then I, I got too far gone. Okay, got it. Okay. But that, those are the four items, Mr. Chairman, and that concludes the Deputy Commissioner's report unless somebody has some questions. Uh, like I said, and Bill, we're going to talk about this in terms of planning issues going forward. Yes, sir. Better. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we've gone back and forth here a little bit. I believe that we're back to item number four on my sheet, uh, which is auditing uh, once again. And this, Tony, I believe is your subject for the moment. And this is consideration of approval of the internal audit on financial aid and enrollment audit of Houston Community College. So, <clears throat> Tony, it's uh, your presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. We we have uh, provided you with the the audit report on the audit of the financial aid and enrollment at the Houston Community College. On the financial aid side, uh, we, we find that the institution co comply with all the rules and uh, regulations of the coordinating board. However, on the enrollment side, we, we came across several instances uh, wherein they, they did over a report on uh, some of the contact hours, bo both in the credit uh, co courses and also co continue ed education co courses. However, due, due to the li limited scope of our testing, we could not uh, uh, pro project those errors in, in, in order to, to, to be able to, to arrive at, at an amount that uh, the, 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 the school may, may eventually hold us. We, we only did uh, summer one, summer two, and uh, fall of 08. If we had done spring of 09, then we, we would have been able to co cover the, the, the whole base year. And uh, because uh, according to the statute, you cannot apply that on, uh, unless the, the, the average or the error cover the, the whole base year. But however, we, we do intend to go back and do 
and uh, revisit these issues when when we start our next go go around of institutional audit. And uh, the, the other finding was that uh, they did not have uh, a, a system in place to to monitor the the social security number of uh, of, of some of the students. And, uh, that, that, that is the conclusion of that uh, report. Tony, on the um, the Houston Community College, was there some uh, limitation on the amount of information that you were able to generate there for your um, audit? The, the, I know you're talking about going back yes. to revisit the, the whole issue. Yes. Uh, just two questions. One is, am I right in that there was you need to go back to complete the, the, the effort? Yes. And the other is, what it would be your timetable to, to make a second visit? We we would need to go go back and, and revisit that part, a particular issue. And I think uh, we need to give, give, give them some time, maybe t t t t towards the end of uh, FY 10, then we, we will go back. And, and, and when we do, we, we make sure we, we do co cover the, the whole uh, base year. Okay. Yes. Any other questions, Brenda? Do you have any uh, thoughts about that? Well, no, but what we might want to consider, because the motion here is consideration of approval, and since um, we are going back in at some point to conclude our, our audit, we may want the motion to either be consideration to accept the report instead of approve the report, or to just table the report until we get to the final, although I understand that won't be till the end of 2010. Just a suggestion. <coughs> Well, I guess we could accept the report as presented, okay. and uh, if that's satisfactory with the committee, and then we come back at another time to finish up the, the final approval, based on whatever Tony discovers when he's there. All right. Well, then I I, I can make the motion to accept the report uh, again based on the information that you're going to yeah. go back right. in at the end of 2010. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have that's, a motion. That's to, my motion. Okay, that's your motion. Okay, and a second. Bye. I'll second it. Okay, bye, Fred. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Okay, next item on the agenda is a discussion of updates on external audits. The next item in discussion of updates on external audits, Tony will uh, present that as well to yeah. provide updates to the uh, audits that are being conducted at the agency. Yes, sir. This item is discussion only and no action is required. So, yeah, we, we, we have a five or a, a, a external that is going on around the, the agency, and the, the first one is the U.S. Department of Education, which was a follow-up audit on the past over billing of, of, uh, of uh, an inexact amount for the federal special allowance on uh, some loans. The, the issue was identified by the State Auditor's Office in the audit of the A113 A of, uh, of, of fiscal year two, 2006. We, we have not uh, heard uh, from, from them in terms of the exact amount that uh, we may end up paying back. I think uh, Dr. Alonso has much more information on this. But, uh, but, but, but uh, we, we we do not think it is going to be able to exceed the the, the amount that we had already estimated it to be. I think it was around two two hundred thousand. The 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 second audit is the uh, financial audit of the KKPMG, which uh, you you've already uh, received the, the report, and the, the third one is the audit of the state uh, financial aid program being conducted by the state auditors office, and uh, we we have been very, very active in in assisting them with uh, whatever we we can. And uh, we we find that uh, they, they will be visiting s seven institutions of higher education, and uh, plan on re releasing their their report in uh, January two two thousand ten. 
and uh, the fourth one is the A1 Type 3 audit that with the, the field work is going to be, be begun uh, in in the in uh, September. And it's again it's, it's by the the State Auditor's Office and the K, KPMG. And the the, la, the, the, the last one is a postponement audit by the state uh, co controller of a public account. The, the, the scope of the audit included accounts payable, payroll, and, uh, and, and the human resources. From the exit uh, conference that we had a couple of days ago, I don't think they, they, they did not come out with anything, uh, any uh, serious uh, deficiencies. Okay. Any questions, discussion? Any action to be taken? A report on. Okay. okay. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda, and we're back with you, Arturo. This has to do with the uh, consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the committee regarding the coordinating board's operating budget for fiscal year 2010. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to present to you the uh, to the committee the FY10 operating budget uh, for your consideration. Uh, I'd like to point out that you have a revised copy on your at your place uh, when you uh, when you came, which is slightly different uh, than and then there's only one difference that I will get into here uh, as I get into the details. But only one one of the strategies changed from what you received two weeks ago and uh, have been reviewing. And like I said, I'll point that out in a little bit more detail. So the revised one that we're working off is the one that both are the same color and the same format, the same uh, same size and so forth, but the one that you are working off now has today's date on it, July 29th. It is still proposed because we put that on the, on the uh, cover until the full board uh, approves the budget, and then we'll change that to approve budget and publish it as we uh, and distribute it as, as needed. Uh, while I'm, I'm the one presenting the proposed budget, I'd like to acknowledge that this document is a collective effort of many people uh, at the agency. Uh, and I, if I may, just take a couple of minutes, Mr. Chairman, um, to acknowledge that uh, what, my, what I call my, my budget team up in the business office, uh, Dan Weaver, Susan Kareen, and Jose Rios, uh, two of who are in the audience today, one, uh, Susan Kareen, off touring Europe uh, and taking a, uh, unavailable to answer any questions, but uh, she um, very confident that uh, the other two members of the team can answer all your questions. I also want to acknowledge that the assistant commissioners and their staff uh, were very instrumental and very helpful in preparing their, the, the budget, as well as other executive officers uh, in the commissioner's office and, and, and in other offices. Uh, and I would be remiss, uh, even if, if it's been mentioned already, uh, if I didn't give special thanks to the ad hoc committee that we've heard from, uh, who provided review and suggestions, uh, several phone calls. Uh, Brenda, Lynn, we appreciate that. We appreciate your, your feedback and your suggestions to come up with a better budget. So uh, thank you for, for doing that. Uh, I would like to also take just a minute or, or two to outline the process because I think it's important uh, and significant that it is a process that is collaborative. Uh, it's an open process and one that from the day that I got here, I pledge that we will strive to develop the budget in, in that manner. Uh, the, the, the budget uh, started off, or the budget process started off by uh, general direction and instructions provided by yours truly and the budget team, uh, the assistant commissioners then developing their budgets uh, along with the other uh, XOs, executive officers, where they built their first draft, submitted it through uh, to the budget team who reviewed it. They had meetings. They went back and forth. Uh, finally uh, came up with what both the budget team and the assistant commissioners uh, were comfortable with. Uh, they then met with uh, the two deputy commissioners, uh, David Garner and myself, and we took a very, very close look at what the assistant commissioners and the XOs had come up with. Uh, in fact, we met a couple of times because uh, both of us had a lot of questions. Uh, based on what we then, the two deputy commissioners, um, our input and what we revised and adjusted, we took the budget and we presented it to the commissioner uh, and gave him an overview of that. Um, 
let me let me just hit on some of the budget highlights, which uh, I, I don't intend to go in strategy by strategy, uh, unless, uh, except the one that I have already mentioned before. Uh, the FY10 budget represents an increase of about $252 million or 38% from the FY09 operating budget, the current year. Uh, you will see that on page one of, of the budget. Um, I think that this is significant because in the current economic times, uh, the fact that we received an increase, let, let alone an increase of that size, um, it speaks to the commitment by the legislature uh, to higher education and to the students of the state of Texas. I think it speaks also to the fact, uh, and you've heard the commissioner say this after the session, uh, but I think this is a, a, an example of it, to the fact that the, the members of the legislature uh, do have a high regard for the coordinating board and the staff and uh, for the work that we do over here. So we're pleased that we were able to come up with that. Uh, we're even more pleased, or, or equally pleased, pleased, I guess I should say, that about 50% of that $252 million increase, or approximately 126 million of it, uh, is in financial aid. Uh, again, that's reflected in your page, uh, on page one. Um, the, the increase, uh, uh, the rest of the 50% the, the of the increase comes in our health programs, which is one of the programs that I will specifically talk about. Uh, some increases to our research and to some of the new strategies, uh, such as House Bill 51. Um, but we, we're very pleased that all the major financial aid programs that are targeted to public higher education, that is Texas Grants, the Be On Time, and the TEOG, uh, Texas uh, Educational Opportunity Grant for community colleges, all receive a, an increase in funding. Uh, the other one is that receive a significant increase is the Professional Nursing Reduction Program. And that is a change that you have from the uh, original budget I sent to you to the one that you have before you. I also, I believe, sent you an email last Friday alerting you to some of the questions that have been coming up. Uh, the Professional Nursing Reduction Program was funded by the legis legislature at $27,350,000 for FY10. Uh, this is an increase of about uh, $20 million. Uh, current year, I believe it's uh, right at $7 million uh, for that program. The rider that is attached to that appropriation states that the coordinating board may use up to 5% of the appropriation to fund administrative costs. Uh, as we were trying to meet deadlines and come up with a budget that we could send to you for review, uh, we uh, use a, uh, a figure, a placeholder, if you will, that took approximately 3.4% of those funds uh, to, to fund administrative costs within the agency. Uh, that was uh, merely a placeholder, which was, amounted to a, a big placeholder because 34 uh, of $27 million is a lot of money. And so we started getting a lot of questions. Uh, commissioner, uh, this is last week, Commissioner asked us to go back and scrub a budget, uh, our cost, to come up with detailed analysis uh, and to come up with what we think is a true cost. cost. Um, the, and so what, that is the revision that you see in your budget. If you would look at page three, I believe, uh, of your budget, you will see there where we outline the trustee funds uh, down towards the bottom of the page, uh, one, uh, Gold D Strategy 1.12 uh, has that, that allocation that I just talked about, the 27.3 million, uh, and the transfer to the coordinating board, uh, to the operating budget of $121,000, uh, 121,522 to be exact. That represents half of a percent of the total allocation that we are using for uh, uh, administration. Uh, it is consistent, uh, very consistent with the, uh, the fiscal note analysis that we do on any request that comes from the LBB during the, uh, the session where we uh, take the cost and apply a 20% uh, indirect administration for indirect uh, administrative costs. And that's how we came up with that, that issue. So uh, I regret and I apologize if uh, the placeholder 
cause anybody any consternation. I know there was a lot of questions, a lot of misinterpretation. Um, I I wish that I had not that I had not gone forth with a placeholder, but uh, in retrospect, uh, you know I, we had to get the budget out. But uh, what we're asking you to approve today is the uh, the amount of uh, twenty seven million three hundred fifty thousand dollar allocation to that program with the uh, 121 522 coming out of that for uh, administrative costs. Uh, related to that program, the other thing that I would like to point out is that in that $27,350,000, uh, there is a one-time pass-through amount that goes to UT Arlington Nursing Program in the amount of uh, $5 million, and that we will pass through in its entirety. We will not assess any administrative costs to that because it's it's just a one. There's no administration involved with that, other than to uh, uh, to cut a check to uh, UT Arlington uh, sometime after the beginning of the year. Um, the the only other thing that I would like to point out in relation to the budget is that um, uh, more of a uh, where we're heading uh, from a strategic direction. Uh, when I got here uh, over two years, uh, a little bit over two years ago, uh, we recognized uh, very early on, well, it had been recognized before, but we uh, actually started uh, discussing and, and, and analyzing the fact that this agency uh, over the years has built up uh, what I consider an over-reliance and over-dependence uh, uh, towards using loan funds to, uh, to balance the budget. Uh, I started talking to the commissioner and uh, proposing to him that we need to start moving away from that. That we need to start finding, especially with the commissioner's charge to us uh, and to staff, to go out and, and seek external funding, which we, uh, I might say, we have been very successful. Not me, but the staff has been very successful in bringing external funding to the agency. So the direction that we're heading towards is that as we bring in external funds, we spread that administrative cost, which is only fair and right, and also gets us away from that over-reliance of if we were to lose for any reason or to get out of the loan program, uh, you know, we wouldn't be caught in a situation of what do we do, where do we get our administrative cost. So I, I'm appreciative for the commissioner's support on that. Uh, I'd like to say that not only has been very supportive, uh, he, has, he has asked us to look at that very, very closely as we, as we move forth on our, our future budgets. Um, I'm also uh, pleased to know that the FY10 indirect administration budget, uh, because of that move towards that direction, now consists of about 30 percent funding from the loan program, which is down from approximately 50 percent in the current year. So we are moving uh, towards a more equitable distribution of administrative funding. And it's, like I said, it, it's the right thing to do, and it's the ethical thing to do. And, and the Commissioner, uh, I appreciate the support that he has given us to that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, uh, that concludes my presentation on the budget. I know I went over it rather fast, uh, simply because we've got 32 more agenda items to cover today. Uh, but uh, not, not because this is not important. But I will be pleased. Uh, uh, the team is here. The team minus one uh, is here to uh, answer any questions or provide you any additional uh, details on the FY10 operating budget. Are there any questions? Fred? Uh, yep. Um, Arturo? By the way, I mean, I commend you on that last point that you made on reducing the dependency upon the student loan business to cover the agency's administrative overhead. That's a significant step forward and the right trend. Thank you. Um, just a couple questions. There's a, uh, on the page one, the summary page, uh, footnote <coughs> F refers to uh, funding from the Higher Education Policy Institute being redirected to the College for All Texans Foundation. Could you uh, explain that? Yes. Um, the, the funding from the Texas, uh, excuse me, from the uh, Houston Endowment Foundation came two years ago, and for whatever reason, the proposal was uh, sent in before I got here. Uh, it was submitted on behalf of the coordinating board. So the funds came to the coordinating board. Uh, it should have well, we realized later that it should have gone to the foundation. So the commissioner asked uh, Mr. France to uh, ask the foundation to redirect those funds to the uh, uh, to the to our foundation for ease of administration and 
for other reasons. Uh, excuse me. Yes, uh, the, uh, Fred, uh, the, the reason was very simply was if, if, uh, if uh, the money were, were uh, allocated directly to the court aiding board, then that money has to, be, has to be subject to state rules and policies regarding the use of it. For example, uh, we, we brought in some consultants to help us uh, on our policy initiatives. And uh, if that money uh, is, uh, is designated state money, we can't even buy lunch for these folks. And uh, as you well know, uh, so we, we yeah. thought that we would have more, <laughs> we'd have more flexibility by directing it through the, uh, uh, through the uh, uh, foundation. So we could I, just say the donor made the check out incorrectly? No, no, no. We actually uh, obtained a, uh, an amendment to the uh, to the grant, and 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 the reason that you see that change here, uh, the long answer to your question is that the foundation, the Houston Endowment, agreed, but they agreed to transfer it when the first check uh, that we spent our money that had come over here already uh, ran out, and so it runs out somewhere in 2010. So that's why it transfers over. There. Uh, the, the second that's question. all legal, is that right? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, that's what Mr. France tells us. <laughs> He's nodding his head, so we're, we're okay. <laughs> we, we, have to tr we have to trust our general counsel on this. <laughs> I wanted to hear him say it. There's a lot of move, but a big money here. <laughs> uh, yeah, for the record, he nodded his head. Arturo, the other question I had was on footnote H. Uh, and this kind of tracks through some other pages about the indirect admin increase being due to moving expenses, which I understand, and centralizing payment functions. So it's a two-part question. I couldn't isolate, although it may be in here, how much of that is the moving expenses? Uh, I don't think, I think it's uh, it's in the strategy H, and that's in page... Uh, well, it's on the next page. There's, there's an operating and support line, but there's not a individual column for moving expenses well no no not individual that would be under other operating expenses right but uh, which is building lease custodial security utilities and possible moving expenses right all so that two million four seven two million four seventy do we know it seemed like we had a a two million dollar LBB line item well we had requested LBB or uh, legislative funding for for the move and for maybe increased cost to the uh, for the building we did not receive it went in as a special line item funding uh, on our uh, LAR we did not receive any of that but I believe uh, you know say tell me the exact amount we budgeted three hundred thousand dollars for moving five hundred Five hundred thousand dollars. So that's part of that. The other, the other part to your question, uh, Fred, is, um, and, and I, I know I'm going to miss some, but uh, in the past we let the divisions pay for such things as uh, copying cost, uh, uh, employee training, for example, out of their budgets. We just found out that that was inefficient. We centralized that to where we pay for it out of a central uh, business account. Okay, so that centralizing of payment functions means you're pulling those back from the departments into the reducing their budgets and just putting it all in exactly. direct. Okay. Yes, sir. And do we know how much that amounted to? Two eighty-three. Probably like two eighty-three. We have a breakdown of all the two hundred eighty-three thousand. Yes. <clears throat> Chairman, that's, that answers my two questions. On, on page four, I have a question. On page four, uh, where we're talking about Navarro Community College reimbursement, a million five hundred thousand. Um, does that square us away with them? It will once the the, the payment comes comes in. But we haven't gotten the payment yet. So. Uh, no, well, the well, check didn't clear yet. <laughs> well, I don't think we've sent them the funds yet. Uh, we, I know we've notified them. Uh, we're working with them. Susan Brown, I don't know if he can add anything to that, but we're in the process of getting that cleared up. Uh, is that yes. a fair statement? That is, that is a fair statement. And actually, they are taking it to their August board meeting so that their board of trustees can officially vote on it, and then they will be sending us a check. Okay, so that will clean up the whole thing. That will take in. care of that. Okay, good. Thank you, Susan. Uh -huh. um, I, have a, I have another question. On my uh, notes here, we're talking about um, getting approval to go forward with this uh, 2010 budget. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, 
do we have the authority to do that in the AOC committee meeting, or do we just have the authority to approve moving it up to the full board for there? We recommend approval to the full board. Mr. Okay, Chairman. because I, I wanted to make sure because that wasn't clear. Okay, so do we have any other <coughs> questions then about uh, <coughs> this area of discussion? If not, then I'd like to have a motion to approve the full year 2010 operating budget be approved by this committee and moved uh, forward to the full board for final consideration. So moved. Moved by Bob Wingo. Second. Second. By Fred. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion approved. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is agenda item V or 5B in uh, consideration of authorizing a continuation of active advisory committees which will expire on August the 31st of 09 unless continued by the board. And Tony Alexander is going to discuss this item. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're asking you to reauthorize the agency's active uh, advisory committees. This is just a standard process that all state agencies go through every four years. The divisional staff have reviewed all the uh, advisory committees and they've made recommendations to reauthorize 12 active committees based on uh, need and productivity. Any questions? Any discussion? Well, that's pretty straightforward. May I have a motion to approve and uh, the authorization to continuation of the advisory committees? So moved. So moved by Fred. Second. Seconded by Bob Wingo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Okay. Next item is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation for an amendment to section 1.16 of board rules concerning contracts and grants for materials and services. Bill Franz is here to discuss that with us. <coughs> Bill? Thank you, sir. Uh, the way Rule 1.16 currently reads, if a request for a purchase of materials or services has been approved by the board or the agency operations committee, depending on which has particular jurisdiction, uh, that, and presuming that that purchase will result in multiple contracts, each of which has a value of 100000 or less, we, at that point, under the current rule, still have to take each contract to the chair and vice chair for approval. At least that's been the conservative reading of the, of the language as it presently is. Uh, the, this amendment would allow for clarification and a streamlining of the approval process by allowing the agency operations committee or the board, whichever has jurisdiction over the purchase in question, to approve. And then if no particular contract issued under that purchase, for example, you had an RFP with 10 contracts, each of which was $30,000, you'd have a total amount approved by the AOC of $300,000, but those 10 contracts each in the amount of $30,000 could, under this amendment, be approved by the commissioner or the deputy commissioner. And the idea is to streamline the process and to clarify the intent of the current rule. Are there any questions? Did we have a discussion some time back, maybe not on this particular subject, about uh, breaking these contracts up into smaller pieces and moving those out through the under the radar as opposed to putting them all together into one bundle? That, that's, that's this amendment. Okay. So what you're saying is that we do want to indeed piecemeal it. It, it, well, you'd have the total picture. You'd get the big right. picture at either the AOC or the board, depending right. on the amount of the contract. But then the individual, or depending on the amount of the RFP, then the individual contracts would be broken out, as you said. And yes, sir. Does that smell good? 
<laughs> I think it does. Uh, I mean, it, it's really a matter of whether the chair and vice chair want to be bothered with ten individual contracts, even though they've approved the RFP. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, Bill and, and uh, Mr. Chair, we we discussed this with Bill because this came up. This has come up numerous times where Fred and I are looking at these, and yet the thing that Fred and I both felt comfortable with is if this committee or the board is looking and has approval authority over an overall contract. And so if it's a $300,000 contract, then what we're basically saying is that's we're going to be able to look at that at this committee level or at the board level, depending if it's over the board limit or over the ALC limit. And then after that, whatever the miscellaneous component parts that add up to that 300000 is, we're, you know, yeah, I feel very comfortable with that. Um, and, and I think that um, I, I, I can't think of, Fred, a contract that in that scenario we've ended up really declining. We might ask a question or something. But the key thing in our mind was to make sure that the amount that is being <coughs> contracted for gets approved by AOC and or the board if it's up to that limit. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for a more efficient use of, you know, all of our time, allow the, you know, allow the contracts to be driven out on an individual basis as long as they don't aggregate. Now, if it goes up over 100000 Bill. If any contract individually would exceed $100,000, it would still go to the board chair and vice chair. go back to me. Even that. though it was yeah, right. part of a larger purchase Initially, that was already approved. That particular contract would go back to the board chair and vice chair. But anything under a hundred would yeah. stay so long as it's been approved. Well, I just want to make sure that whatever we're doing here is cricket and legal. And if it is, it is. Then next next time. Well, we have to. Uh, okay. To is there any other? Oh, yeah. Is there, I'm just saying we're going to move on pretty quick. Is there any other discussion on this particular subject? Your train, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's going to be a fast train. <laughs> okay. Then uh, do we have a motion to uh, accept the recommendations made? So moved. Brother Fred? Motion second? Second. By Brenda? All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next item. It's consideration of adopting the Commissioner's recommendation for a new section 1.19 of board rules concerning education and training of board administrators and employees pursuant to section 656.048 of the Texas Government Code. Again, Bill, will you tell us what that all means? Yes, sir. And this probably looks familiar to you because you adopted this on an emergency basis at the April board meeting. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, basically, in order for an agency to provide training, education, to its employees, it must have both rules and policies allowing that. This agency has a policy allowing it. We need a rule. We used to have rules allowing it, but inadvertently at last October's board meeting, when uh, other rules surrounding what amounts to the rule in front of you right now were uh, revoked, the, this rule ended up in that same pot and was uh, revoked. And as a result, we need to have a new rule in its stead. And so that's what this, this uh, agenda item does. Okay. Okay, any discussion, question? If not, do we have a motion? Uh, I'll make the motion to approve. Okay. Second. <clears throat> Brenda made this motion and Bob seconded it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I have a motion to adopt. Thank you. Next item is uh, 5E, in consideration of adopting the Commission's recommendation relating to an amendment to the uh, Memorandum of Understanding between Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and College for All Texans Foundation, Closing the Gaps. And here to present this subject again is Bill France. <laughs> Can't get away, Bill. Uh, 
Um, as a matter of background, the board of the College for All Texans Foundation has already approved this proposed amendment. Uh, what, it, what it does is it adds a proviso that allows the College for All Texans Foundation to use any funds or donations it receives from its fundraising, its solicitations, um, to assist the coordinating board in administering scholarship programs, including but not limited to those, funded under Rider 44 House Bill 1, the General Appropriations Act from not this past session, but the one prior to that, and that's the license plates, and to administer grants from various entities, including but not limited to grants from the Gates Foundation and the Houston Endowment. So it's expanding somewhat the authority of the foundation. Are there any questions? Uh, I'm just a question why we why is there a need to actually name any specific foundations in item number six rather than just saying to administer grants from various entities there isn't a, a an absolute need to do that if you would be more comfortable with it out of there it, I mean if it's a, if it's a uh, I guess it doesn't really make any difference those are the two grants that that are currently there Going forward, it isn't going to make a difference if it's from should not Lumina or either way the Bill Franz Foundation or whatever. <laughs> the Franz Foundation already gave uh, already six dollars last year. And <laughs> right. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. If not, are there any questions for before we let Bill go? If not, then may I have a motion? So moved by Bob Ringo and a second. Fred, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Next agenda item is 5F, in consideration of adopting staff recommendation uh, relating to the distribution of funds trustee to support medical and graduate medical education for fiscal year 2010 and report on trustee funds distributed in uh, fiscal year 2009. And Stacy Silverman is going to make this presentation. Stacy? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to walk you through uh, the various programs. And uh, um, feel free to ask me any questions as you need to. So, five programs will provide funding support for medical and graduate medical education in fiscal year 2010. Graduate medical education, as many of you have heard me say before, also called residency training, is the final stage that a physician must complete before opening or beginning entering practice following graduation from medical school. Uh, residency training varies in length from three to seven years depending upon the medical specialty. The first of the three programs on the list that you're taking a look at today is the Family Practice Residency Program. This program provides funding support to the state's family practice residency program statewide. <coughs> We've got these residency programs located from Texarkana to El Paso, from Tyler to Abilene and Amarillo and Wichita Falls to Harlingen. So they're located all over the state. Since the program's inception, funding has supported more than 7,730 family practice residents. Notably, 80% of these remain in the state and practice medicine. Funding uh, recommendations are made to the commissioner by the statutory 12-member advisory committee. The legislature provided a funding increase this session of $3 million for the program. This will allow some programs that were not previously funded to receive funding under this funding stream and will increase the, the level of per resident funding from 2009 level of 12,800 per resident to an estimated 14,200 per resident. Additionally, this program also supports the Family Practice Faculty Development Center, which is a training center to help uh, encourage 
new family practice positions to become program directors and in our academic medicine, as well as the rural and public health rotation program, which encourages residents to go out and spend a month in a rural community and consider what it's like uh, and help physician distribution in that way. The next, Tracy, yes. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of the folks that go through that rural rotation serve that market? It's actually a fairly interesting group. Because they self-select, they're more likely to go into a rural community anyway. Um, but about 60% of them practice in populations of 50,000 or less. And you, know, you can't really run a medical practice if you're in a, a very small, uh, small populated area. But we do consider that to be a pretty important indicator that the program works. Again, it is self-selected. So these are folks who are already interested in rural medicine. So we think that's good. All right, I'll move on to the next program. The Primary Care Residency <coughs> Program was established in 1995 to provide funds to new and not previously funded primary care residency programs. Those include general internal medicine, general pediatrics, and obstetrics gynecology and those family medicine residency programs that were not able to be funded under that original family medicine program. We have since transferred this, this year, in fiscal year 2010, we'll transfer those two remaining family practice programs over to the family practice program and uh, we'll fund only internal medicine, pediatrics, and OB-GYN. Because the legislature gave a little bit more money to the family practice program, it'll free up about $600,000 to expand out some residency positions for primary care. We'll have an advisory committee that will meet in the fall uh, and help us make those funding decisions and, of course, come back and inform you all about them. Uh, in fiscal year 2009, the fund provided statutory funding level of 15000 to support 166 residents training in primary care programs statewide. The funding is given on behalf of the resident, but it may be expended on any educational endeavors that the program seeks to, to spend the funding on. And I ask, the staff estimates this funding level to be maintained in fiscal year 2010. The third program on your list is the Graduate Medical Education Program. It was originally pro uh, created to support the state's interest and in, to increase interest in uh, graduate medical education statewide. In the uh, 80th Texas Legislature transferred the majority of the program funds to the newly, then newly established Graduate Medical Education Formula Funding Stream. It transferred about $3 million over that program. It left to us uh, the $300,000 annually for us to then distribute out to residency programs that are independent or are not uh, sponsored or affiliated with a Texas medical school or health-related institution. So um, in fiscal year 2009, the board contracted with 12 teaching hospitals and local foundations to support independent residency training programs, providing a per-resident funding of about $879 to 341 primary care residents. Staff estimate that a similar number of residents will be supported in fiscal year 2010. The two final programs actually support medical education efforts. That is, the students, while they're either preparing for medical school or while they're in medical school. The first one is the statewide preceptorship program. It supports three efforts to encourage Texas medical school students to consider primary care medical specialties as their future medical career. Three distinct programs support family medicine, general internal medicine, and general pediatrics. The board contracts with these three organizations to administer and coordinate the student experiences. Texas medical students may shadow a volunteer physician in any region of the state, and they receive a small stipend between $500 and $700 to complete the month-long experience. 
The guiding premise of the preceptorship experience is that early exposure to a primary care medical specialty may positively influence future career decisions and practice patterns. More than 300 medical students typically participate in the preceptorship program, with most participating during the summer between their first and second year of medical school. <clears throat> students may select from a volunteer faculty precepting list of about 1,250 primary care physicians located statewide. Students work in practicing physicians' offices and experience the daily life of working with primary care physicians. Often, this is the first time a physician will experience a life-changing event, such as a birth or a death. The preceptorship program in family medicine was established in 1978, and it served as a model for the development and establishment in 1995 of the programs in internal medicine and pediatrics. Staff estimates that funding level for 2010 will be maintained at the 2009 level and will likely support 300 medical students in one of the preceptorship experiences. The last one on your list is the Joint Admissions Medical Program, also called JAMP, um, which was established by the Texas Legislature in 2001. The JAMP program was created to support and encourage highly qualified, economically disadvantaged students to pursue medical education. When selected into the program, students receive mentoring and scholarships and attend a summer internship at one of the Texas medical schools. Students who satisfy both academic and non-academic requirements <coughs> receive a guarantee of admission to at least one participating Texas medical school. The coordinating board requested an increase in funding for JAMP, and the Texas legislature provided an additional $5 million to the program for this biennium. The additional funding will continue, uh, will be, will, will provide continued support for the 192 undergraduates currently in the program, the 158 medical students in the program, and will allow an additional 150 new undergraduates to be added in 2010. The first cohort of JAMP students will graduate from Texas medical schools in the spring. This program is, on the, is designated on your list, list as a non-discretionary item because we transfer the entire amount of funds over to the JAMP program, which sits at the University of Texas System Office. That concludes my report, and I'm happy to address any questions. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Lori? See, what do we, what do, we do um, like thinking about the, the JAMP program, what do we do with um, high school students and, and undergraduates that know that they want to go into medical field, into the medical field, but they end up going out of state? Is there anything that we do or can do to bring them back? I'm thinking in terms of the, the um, overview that we received recently about the numbers of attorneys in the state of Texas and, and if, if there's a need for, for law schools versus the number of um, um, doctors or, or future doctors in a program and do we need more doctors and that sort of thing, or more medical schools. Um, is there anything that we could or should be doing to attract um, medical students back to Texas? Well, it, we, we are very attractive. Our medical schools are very attractive to um, Texas residents. So um, the tuition at our schools is relatively low. I don't want to say it's very low because it's not. It's very expensive to become a physician. On average, medical students are graduating with $140,000, $150,000 of debt. But I will say that our tuition and fees at our Texas medical schools are relatively low in comparison to the other states, making, it, making them very attractive to, um, to those students who may have gone out of state to get their undergraduate degree. So we can certainly look into I guess the, the part of what you're asking is are we underserved in parts of the state? I do recall distinctly that the ratio of attorneys to primary care physicians per 100,000 right is about three to one. We, we certainly need more physicians in Texas. And all of our medical schools have been growing over the last, increasing their enrollments over the last few years. And we anticipate that will continue. But even, is it taking it a step further for students that are in medical schools outside of the state of Texas, but that have gone to 
a Texas school, either undergraduate, graduate, um, is there anything to attract them back to practice in Texas? Well, first Actually, they have to be accepted in a, in a residency program. That's true. Which is not exactly the easiest thing to do. Correct. We don't have enough residencies. That is that's very correct, clincher. too. Clincher. The expansion of these residency programs, yeah. that's why it's so, it's so critical. Right. We bring in more dollars for, for expanding residency programs. Because the proportion, 80% stay here. I mean, the flip side is wherever these physicians are doing their residencies are typically where they stay. Right. That's absolutely right. Are there uh, uh, primary care disciplines besides these three? Family practice, internal medicine, and pediatrics? Um, also, obstetrics gynecology is considered um, a primary care specialty in Texas. It's sort of, it, it can be considered a surgical residency or a surgical specialty or a primary care, but because Texas allows women to identify their OB-GYN as their primary care physician, we consider it primary care. Yeah. Are some of these residency programs moving more into the federally qualified health center arena? Absolutely. We have quite a few of the family medicine residency programs that are, are FQHCs. And that's going to be a growing opportunity, especially given the stimulus funding that's coming down for federally qualified health centers. So Absolutely. That's going to be a key link for us keeping our medical students here. Orthopedics for baby boomers is not a primary. <laughs> is, is, not at uh, this point. Is, is Can we do something about that? Um, geriatrics. You know, geriatrics, yeah. geriatrics is. <laughs> it's actually a fellowship program, so you can complete internal medicine. <laughs> they go on. So. <laughs> That's probably going to be a priority here. There you go. Um, the other thing is the uh, the JAMP uh, the JAMP program is also significant in helping us with in terms of our diversity. We talk about teacher diversity and cult being uh, culturally engaged with the demographics, the physician population, and the clinical teams also need to be uh, culturally aligned with our, our demographics, and that, that is a key program to helping us in terms of recruiting the under, uh, underrepresented groups within the medical community. Wonderful program. Absolutely. Thank you, and I can okay, stay from the next it? agenda. Tracy? <laughs> okay, well, let's, did we cover the, the various items here? I have another item, it's to Norm Hackerman. That's the next agenda item okay, on your, well, on your then list. Okay, well, we've got to have two votes in here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, do I have a motion to accept St uh, Stacy's uh, recommendation? So we're bobbing it. Can we go a second? Uh, I'll second. Okay, Brenda, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, then the next one is uh, the Stacy is yours uh, as well. Absolutely. Agenda item 5G is the consideration of adopting the staff recommendation related relating to the Norman Hackerman Advanced Research Program request for approval of program announcement for the 2009 competition. The Norman Hackerman Advanced Research Program, what we can call now NHARP, uh, is a competitive peer-reviewed grant program to support basic research projects at Texas public institutions of higher education. The program promotes research designed to attract and retain the best students and researchers and to promote the knowledge base needed for innovation. The 81st Texas Legislature revised the program to include independent higher education institutions and requires funded projects to support undergraduate students at general academic institutions and undergraduate and or graduate students at health-related institutions. The funding available for the NHARP 2009 competition is $16.4 million, which is the same funding level as the 2007 competition. The 2009 program announcement was reviewed by the Board's Advisory Committee on Research Program at its April 8, 2009 meeting. The 2009 program announcement includes the recommended ACOR funding levels for the specific disciplines. And following Board approval of the program announcement, it will be posted to the ARPATP.com website. All eligible institution represented, representatives, public and independent, and investigators will be notified of its availability. The peer review process will begin in the fall, and the board will receive recommendations of proposed grant recipients at its April 2010 meeting. That concludes my report.
Very good. Any other questions, Stacy? I just have a comment. Okay. Board members, take note. This is one of the areas that we need to uh, increase as we go on, and, and we also could use another one of these for baby profs. So uh, <laughs> keep that keep that rolling. This is one of the great things we do. Okay. Any other comments or questions? <clears throat> if not, to uh, <clears throat> Stacy, we thank you very much. May we have a motion now to move approval? Okay. Second. Move approved by Fred. Second by Bob Wingo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is 5H, is consideration of adopting staff recommendations relating to the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Improvement Act funds to colleges and consortia for basic grants, tech prep, and leadership activities for program year 2009 and 10. <coughs> And Susan Hessler is going to make this presentation. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Hinton. Good afternoon, board members, Dr. Alonzo, Commissioner. This agenda item provides you with some brief background information about the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Improvement Act funds and how those funds are used to support career and technical programs that lead to high-skill, high-wage, or high-demand careers. As part of the responsibility delegated to the coordinating board by the State Board of Education, the board annually allocates Perkins funds to the state's public two-year colleges. The information before you today describes the categories and the maximum allocated for each category of post-secondary Perkins funding for the 2009-2010 program year. Approximately $36 million will be allocated as described. This is a routine item. Coordinating board staff recommends approval of the 2009-2010 Perkins allocations. Okay. Any discussion? Comments? Okay. Then uh, we bring this to a vote. Then may I have a motion to uh, go forward. So moved. So moved by Bob Wingo. Second. Second. By uh, Brenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda. The consideration of adopting staff recommendations relating to revisions to the college access <coughs> challenge grant, fiscal year 09 and 10, 2010. Staff is seeking approval for the following four items, an extension and amendment of the Texas uh, Counseling Association contract, and two, approval for funds to uh, the addition of a web portal component to College for All Texans dot com fiscal year 09. Now that is uh, Judy, that's you, is it not? Yes, it is. Very good. Have at it. Good afternoon, Mr. Hinton, uh, committee members, board members, Dr. Alonso, and Commissioner. The first item I bring for you before you this afternoon is the board staff is requesting the extension and amendment of the coordinating board's contract currently with the Texas Counseling Association that we've had in 2009. The uh, Counseling Association has developed the trainer of trainer model that we are using with public school counselors across the state through the education service centers. What we are seeking is an extension of that contract for an additional $65,000 under the College Access Challenge Grant funding, which allows us by federal approval to carry, o carry over unused funds. We are seeking to use these funds to uh, work with the Counseling Association to develop the training model to work with the post-secondary counselors. I just said a minute ago we're working right now with the elementary counselors. We would now like to work with the community college and university counselors. This uh, reason that we are bringing it back to you today for the approval and the amendment is because according to Board Rule 1.16, anything over 10 percent must come back to the committee. This was presented to the PNS committee on June the 22nd. Um, of 2009 and approval was granted. And I don't know if you want to take an individual vote. I think. Uh, yeah, I think so, don't we? Yes. Okay. Um, so what we're seeking now is approval to issue a request for application for College Connection 2 plus 2 plus 2 program fiscal year 2010. Mm -hmm. No. No, no. It's, it's, no. It's, 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 
I, we need the approval on the on amendment the for the Texas Counseling Association contract. That's one of the other items that I'll be addressing in just a moment under the College Access Challenge Grant. Yeah. Okay, an extension of the amendment of the Texas Counseling Association contract. Okay. We need a, a motion to approve the committee's recommendation, correct? That's correct. So move. Second. Second. By Bob Wingo, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. <clears throat> okay, so then we're moving to two, Judy. Yes, sir. Approval to fund the addition of the web portal components at collegeforalltexans.com, fiscal year 09. Yes, sir. The board staff requests approval to fund three components, and that is the college exploration or explore, no. college financing, and college planning and preparation as additional components that we will add on to the College for All Texan website that we have currently or just recently revised and which you approved and which is on our website. The use of the funds is a good match for the federal requirement of the College Access Challenge Grant regulations. The federal grant office has approved the carryover funds. The total amount of the project is $323,987. It was presented to PNS on June 22nd, 2009, and approval was granted to move forward. Any discussion, questions? Is, uh, is this uh, particularly where college financing is concerned? Uh, don't we also have a site on our, our coordinating board website? Yes, we do have information on that, but this goes a little bit deeper in terms of helping the parents know how to access uh, fast fund everything else. The idea so, is to walk them through all sources of public financial student aid that, in, in one site. In fact, Matt may want to come up here and dress because this is not my greatest strength since I've learned about web portals since I got here. <laughs> but it is, it is our next phase to be able to provide more information for parents on what is totally about out there in addition to the three buckets that we will be grouping this in. We've been doing a lot of research. We finished, I guess, the College for All Texan website about, what, five months ago. And since then, we've been in an extensive research mode to find what we could add to ours that would be enhancing parents and student access to all the information that might be of benefit immediately to help them through that pipeline to get to that college connection. And so that does include the financing. It does include career options. Uh, it does include looking at themselves and their preparedness, where they may have uh, some strengths and weaknesses. So it's, uh, it's three major buckets. It will be a year extension of work in order to get this done. Well, in the, in the second bucket is the goal to make it user-friendly enough for a parent or a student to yes. understand the FAFSA, uh, understand uh, the available federal and state uh, financial aid. It is, and it's also, remember that our new website is in both English and in Spanish. So I would assume that you ought to be able to get from our agency website to this site and vice versa. Yes, you yes, yeah. can. They're being mutually, like, uh, just to really get down in the weeds because I know how much our chairman likes that. Uh, is this case sensitive, collegeforalltexans.com? <laughs> No, but, you know, because I, I access it. Uh, I access it from my office. I've never been to our uh, website. Well, because it's much easier for for us it to promote, not. to tell friends, to tell parents. It's not. Just go to collegeforalltexans.com. It's not case yeah. 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 I, I googled uh, Texas Grant, and if you Google Texas Grant, it, it takes you to the College for All Texans um, website. And it does talk about it was a prerequisite for Texas Grant, and it talks about um, some of the attributes of, of what's necessary to apply. But it does not go to that next level, obviously, um, of talking about what is, uh, for example, a family contribution. Um, what does that mean? How do you calculate it? 
it doesn't talk about it so it talks about the passive form but it doesn't say how to fill it out so I think this is a critical next step that, yeah. that we have to have to move forward if we're also we're looking at that self population shot. of when you enter data we talked about this uh, last Monday when you enter data about yourself your student uh, the family how I can then self populate so there's some things we have to overcome I think the other thing too that was discussed Monday which was quite interesting was a way to also put into the website uh, you know all the most questions that a parent might have that really begins to to really address their needs and they don't look feel like they're looking at a website that's alien but something that's tailored to questions they may not know where to go ask or who to go ask you know, we're, we're all over the place with this uh, there, there are so many different ways to get there ports of entry and uh, and then this also as includes community colleges, doesn't it? It's information on everything. I think the other thing too that is inter that I would like to say to you, in our research, because doing a web portal, as I learned when I first got here, can be massively expensive. I mean, millions and millions of dollars. We have tried to, to look at this in a cost-effective way that the agency could then sustain it. And as, you know, money becomes more readily available, then other things could be added on. But it's been done with a lot of thought to, so that we can make that next leap where we are connecting more to parents, connecting more to students, and channeling them down that pipeline. So it, uh, we come to you today with a lot of serious consideration. This wasn't something we just decided to do because we had the extra money. It's good use of money because it does address the College Access Challenge Grant, and it, we're not spending the millions that uh, a lot of other people have had. Judy, to does the budget and the schedule allow us to bring in uh, trial groups of users like a focus group and They've actually have them. them. And we've done that. We do that as part of whatever we do, even with the College for All Texans redesign, we did focus groups. We will, we, everything we do as we move forth, we'll do again and we'll field try to make sure that it, that it is working. But we're too old to help them. They, you know, they ask for feedback, so I want every single thing that That's I read well, I'm absolutely not is the right. opposite <laughs> of it. The colors are ugly. The trial group loves the colors. <laughs> so just don't try to help. <laughs> but one thing we do have to overcome, I think, is that, uh, and this is part of this larger branding thing that we're going to get into later, but uh, I don't see how we can have a website called College for All Texans that is also trying to attract people to workforce entry level position or workforce positions through certificates and, and so forth. We may need to consider something else because if you Google, you know, well, you certificates can, for workforce, you probably aren't going to get to Well, you can do some some search word things and some point we can we can come up with other addresses that point right back to the same yeah, website. Absolutely. And we have talked about that, I Dr. Sure. Phillips. Uh, I think gotcha. maybe a month or two months ago you raised that concern with me and when I went to it, we meet every Monday. The committee has been very diligent about showing up and, and participating and I brought that concern to the committee and at that time it was stated just very similar to what Mr. Heldensfeld says is that there we would have ways that we could do that even though keep in mind that this is college but if a parent is seeking that kind of information for their student or vice versa then we could offer you know links that would yeah, provide. and we could even duplicate this website, uh, you know, workforce readiness and have the appropriate stuff on it. Well, what you really need are landing pages that then take you to well, the information that you need and also have the link to take you back to the, the main site. Right. Or, yeah, one, one of the things that, um, <coughs> that the state has been supportive of uh, for school districts is to make sure that there is adequate funding um, in high schools, so if they want to hire a college uh, counselor, uh, many of them have taken this money, and I can't remember what it's called, but it was a, it was a, a, um, a type of funding that went specifically for high, high school allotment, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of school districts used that. Some, I think Austin used a grant, Austin ISD used a grant to have college counselors. But still in all, we're not reaching the parents, we're not reaching the real users that are going to try and get there. So this is the opportunity that will open it up to everyone. And I think when we talk about marketing, the one thing that we need to make sure we do is make sure that uh, community colleges have that website everywhere, that 
um, high schools have it, that um, Department of Education uh, in the dif different um, counties have that so that it all links back. Um, this is probably the biggest support side that we can have to the high schools that are already trying to, trying to promote as much as possible. So I think this is really vital to kind of uh, closing that circle of, of you know where we've been and where we need to go to reach all the kids. And in connection to what Mrs. Bricker has just stated, we are beginning the marketing of the College for All Texans website. The counselors that will be coming through the training starting in September are going to be trained on the website. We have posters that when, when the commissioner gives us the clearance that will be made and delivered to every high school, to every high school counselor so they can be put in their offices with post-it notes that are going to the counselors so that they will begin to, to realize we've got to make this connection to this. And that is in the works right now as we speak. So. I, have, I have one more comment uh, based on what Dr. Phillips said. Um, Mr. Wingo, does that mean like if, if a technical school like ITT or some of the others or the private um, um, technical colleges that go toward a cert uh, certification, if they were to have their website, could they link it and then end up there? Is that what you meant? You can link things back any way you want to. Which way you want. So, so if we were to contact, as long as you have permission to. Yeah, if we were to contact like all of the um, um, technical colleges that have certifications and uh, the workforce um, um, opportunities, that they could have that website or their own website linked to it as well. I think the key thing would be, and to what uh, Judy's working on is to make sure that the the webmaster who's writing, or whoever's writing the HTML. <sighs> that this is set up and that you have permission to cross-link all these different areas. But if you want, for example, any company that has a huge website, if you have particular information, you can set up a landing page where you will go straight to the information that's germane to what you're trying to do. And at the bottom there will be a link that takes you to their main website. That would be really helpful. If we could it can be sure done. Do mm -hmm. Again, I don't know what the cost would be, but it can be done. The other thing I would like to mention on the marketing, we are already scheduled to be at four major conferences here in the state that uh, address school administrators, uh, two big counseling meetings, um, and one other that's eluding my, my mind right now to put this website out there as well as the college readiness standards. So we're, we're moving forth so we can get that word out and, and have more users onto the site. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Judy, let's make sure that I'm on the same page you're on. <laughs> okay. You, uh, we've gone through <clears throat> items one and two and three and four. We're going to three and four right now. Okay. We need to vote on item two. We need to vote on item two. Item two, okay. Vote on item two. Yeah. Which is the web portal, the okay. addition of the three components. So uh, on item two, then we need a motion. Move approval. Okay, Second. moved by Fred and seconded by Bob Wingo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, now we move to the presentation on item three. The board staff is requesting approval to issue requests for applications for a second round of College Connection 2 plus 2 plus 2 programs for fiscal year 2010. Uh, when second year CACG funding is received, which is September the 1st. Austin Community College and Blend College will also be contracted with to provide the grantees with best practices for implementation of their programs. Um, ACC has worked with us with the 2 plus 2 program and uh, the two, uh, both 2 plus 2 plus 2 and Blend College has an excellent program they have implemented. So we would like to put out the RFA for the second round. The total cost is two million four hundred and forty thousand. Grant sizes are up to one hundred and eighty thousand. This is college access fund money. PNS approved this on June twenty second, two thousand nine. Right. And the, the handout uh, is just the only difference is this bold face correction to the. Number two million three changed to yes. three forty. That's correct. Yes, there was a we had, typographical error. We had a typo on there. We so. caught it. Yeah, up at the top, though, the total amount is correct. Okay. Any discussions? Questions? That covers item three, Judy. That covers item three. 
And then item four you take a vote is. On that. We got a vote on item three. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to make sure that that we're through. Okay. Any other questions concerning item three? I'll just make a brief comment. <laughs> Very brief. Just commend the coordinating board, the staff for. I remember the the conference years ago where you had found the College Connection Program and brought it to the conference and it has spread across the state and uh, that's that's great work by the, by the staff. It was a Star Award, um, what, three yeah. years ago or something? Yeah. Yeah. And now it's spread all over. Yeah. Good thing. Okay. Anything else? Okay, now we need a motion. Move approval. <coughs> by Fred. Second by Bob Wingo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Item four. This is the second year Clock funding. <laughs> this is the second year funding for the two plus two programs, the college connection programs, and the community partnership programs that we currently have in place this year, based on the meeting of the standards of their completion August 31, which all of them are doing very well. We would like to request approval for their second year funding using the funds of the College Access Challenge Grant. Okay. So moved. Uh, moved by Bob. Second. Second. By Fred. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. I'll leave you for a few minutes. I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. That was cool. I want to make a quick comment, Jeff. No. Mr. Okay. Uh, um, the way that this is laid out is as a result of some um, um, discussion that we had between the Participation and Success Committee and this committee. And the way that, that this, these agenda items are laid out is extremely clear. And it's a result of a lot of discussion. And whoever did it, I'm assuming Dr. Laredo and your team did it, it really makes a lot of sense and makes it, makes it um, helpful for all of us to understand it. So thank you. Very good. Thank you, Judy. Okay, next item on the agenda is 5J, is consideration of request for the purchase of materials or services in excess of $100,000, but less than $750,000. The first request is to extend a contract for Helm Student Loan Software annual usage fee for fiscal year 2010 based on a 12-month term with a not-to-exceed amount of $675,000. And Darla, who invented all this stuff, is now going to tell us how this works. No. <laughs> uh, this is just the ongoing re request to extend the maintenance or the usage fee for fiscal year 10. Uh, are there any questions? It has gone up slightly or gone up because we passed the threshold for our maintenance. Darla, well, I have a question. Did we make any... Uh, uh, guesses as to what we might be doing at this stage in this program when we looked at the money. Is 650 kind of in the ballpark for what we'd planned for initially? Or Dan did the projections, uh, and he's that? shaking his head. So. Yes. We need to pull those spreadsheets, really. You know, I. I'm trying to recall. It's been a long time since we looked this at that. This is called a post audit in the corporate world. You know, I think that there were there were two components. One were were cost savings on on staff reductions, and I think we realized those in the first year of operation. So the cost saving piece is, has already been realized, and I think our escalations we use, Mr. Hinton, were we were um, we were. There's a part of the contract that says you can escalate by 5% per year, and we've been below the 5% per year from a cost, um, from a price that we pay perspective. So I think we're still within the revenue side and the cost side is still on track. We can, I can go back and check the numbers and get back to you. Well, on just that. a curiosity, Adam, because I know we were going back and forth with a lot of money in the early going and a lot of changes taking place, and I kind of lost track of where we were. And when I looked at this, I didn't know whether the 650000 we might have thought was going to be $750,000. Like we can, we can go back and check on those numbers. Uh, just for you. my own curiosity, sure. if you would, I'd appreciate it. Sure, like no problem. Let's we'll send you a report. See how, how smart we were when we made the numbers at, at that time. We were brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Of course. 
One thing to note, these are usage fees. They're not, there's not a upfront license fee and then a maintenance fee. So the, uh, it's a flat usage fee for the life of the support rather than a license fee up front. Yeah, okay. So that's one reason it's higher. Okay, any questions, Darla? <clears throat> If not, then may I have a motion to approve the software annual usage fee for full year 2010 with a not to exceed amount of $675,000? I need a motion. I'll make a motion. By <coughs> Brenda, a second. Bob Wingo, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Darla. Just who's got the next one. Okay. We've got item two. The staff is seeking approval for a fiscal year 2010 a purchase in the estimated amount of $120,000 of network services through an interagency contract with the Department of Information Resources. Again, Darla, uh, this is your item to uh, discuss. Yes. If you would, please. These are the fees or the network fees that are required to connect <laughs> to the San Angelo Data Center and the Austin Data Center that are required for use of the data center services contract under DIR. And we pay those, we pay IBM and the uh, services fees separate from the network fees. So this is the network component of <coughs> using those services. <coughs> okay. Do we have any questions, discussion? This is an annualized cost, right? Yes, it is. <coughs> Okay, any further questions, Garland? If not, do we have a motion? So moved. Moved by Bob. Second? Second. By uh, Brenda. All in favor? Aye. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. We're now halfway through. <laughs> yeah, we're on page 11. <laughs> out of 22. <laughs> Just more to Make sure that uh, you're watching the clock. Would you like so to to take over. <laughs> okay, so much for fun and game. Uh, next item on the agenda is a uh, request for approval of purchases of printing services through an interagency contract with the University of Texas <clears throat> for not to exceed amount of $750,000. The purchase will be through a blanket two-year contract without obligation. So staff is seeking approval for the purchase of uh, these services for $750,000. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, approval. We seek approval for a, a blanket, to execute a blanket contract with a UT printing service. Uh, under existing state law, we can only utilize, I believe there are six printing shops uh, in Austin that we can go to. Yeah. Uh, UT is one of them. They have given us good service in the past. Of course, we've done this before with them. Uh, yes, but this is for the next biennium. Yeah. Uh, so what we seek, and, and this is why we put on there with no guarantee or without any obligation, is that uh, not to exceed uh, in the two-year period $750,000 for our printing services as needed. And so we um, recommend approval. The current biennium we have spent approximately, well, we have spent and encumbered as of yesterday uh, approximately $511,000. We estimate we've got one month to go that it will be somewhere between five hundred eleven and $600,000. Uh, this, even though it's only a blanket approval, uh, we seeking about a 25% increase, uh, mainly because of the anticipated increase printing needs that we have. So uh, we uh, recommend uh, and seek approval, sir. Okay, any discussion? Bob, <coughs> move, second? Second. By Brenda, all in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Let's see, now, the next item on the agenda, we come back to Judy, and this is request approval of purchase of services through a contract regarding the Adult Basic Education Transitions Project, fiscal year 2010. Judy? Board staff request approval of the contract with Texas State University San Marcos for the Adult Basic Education Transition Pilot. Texas State 
has the only adult literacy and developmental education graduate program in the state, and the pilot project expands on the earlier research project conducted by Texas State that identified best practices in adult basic education transition. The purpose of this project will be to validate the identified best practices and determine their scalability. The funding is uh, in the amount of $500,000. It is part of Rider 45 under the College Readiness Initiative. It was approved by PNS on June 22, 2009. I would also add, as I go through the other projects that are listed, uh, we have tried to also list for you the evaluation because there will be extensive evaluation in any of the projects that we move forth that are discussed uh, within this meeting so that I just won't be addressing the evaluation design in the interest of time. Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Raymond, I have a question on these kind of things based on some of our discussions this morning. I wonder if we can work into this a way to get a, some sort of a preliminary report in time for the next session. Oh, uh, yeah. I should have mentioned, when I talk about the evaluation, especially some of these key projects in developmental education, the, uh, the evaluation design is key, and what we will be doing is ensuring that we have information to take to the legislature, which is really gives us not much time within the, this year to be able to start looking at what we're finding so the reports can be ready. This is one of the major uh, focal points on looking at DevEd and some of these projects that we have that data to show that the money, number one, was used wisely, but most importantly, that we are seeing change, that change would come about by the continued use of this funding. Right. Well, I wasn't so much thinking about just the continued use of this funding, but, but maybe wanting to uh, you know, influence some other sorts of policies, but if if we wait 24 months, it'll be too late. Oh, no, we can't. We can't. We know that within this year, this fiscal year that we're entering now, we will already have to be preparing that kind so of you'll information. So you'll have a preliminary point. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that's And we will be great. monitoring all projects even more closely in order to have that information. Yes. Excellent. That's, that's really good. Thank you, Chief. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> may I have a motion? <laughs> so moved. <laughs> motion by Bob, second, second. by... We're thin, huh? Y'all are the only two people besides I, Brenda. We know. Right. Yes, by Brenda, all in favor? Aye. <laughs> motion carries. Aye. Okay, you're, you're still on. You've got about 11 more pages for <laughs> I'll go quickly for you. <laughs> Next item, item number five, requesting approval of a grant to purchase services through a contract regarding the college and career readiness standards regional meetings. Total uh, cost of this project is 200000 20000 per meeting. The board staff is requesting a funding, a second round of regional meetings to, refer, to be referred to as a college and career readiness standards regional roundups. Board staff will contract with 10 institutions of higher education across the state for their college readiness advisors to plan, coordinate, and host these roundups throughout the, uh, in fact, starting in the fall. We hope to be able to reach over 200, over 20 or 2,000 secondary and post-secondary educators in order to increase their awareness of these standards. This was presented to PNS on June 22nd and approval was granted. Discussion? Question? Okay. We had just a quick question, Judy, I wasn't at PNS, but I mean, have, those, have, have, we, have these meetings been effective? Yes. We've been doing around the state? We did the first ones in the fall of this past year, and we did 13 of them. Okay. But it was our first attempt, and through the College Readiness <coughs> Advisors, who we have met with regularly, their recommendations were that they continue because 
it was the first time that in some cases people had heard of the college, in the public arena, had heard of the college readiness standards. So now that the interest is just gaining, it behooves us to take advantage and to get this information out to a broader uh, populace. So instead of working with just 13, we're going to work uh, with them by our regions so that there's 10 regional roundup meetings going on uh, out in the state. Well, they're doing one of these in Tyler in August. Is this is this the same meeting? They're having it, uh, faculty. No, that's not the same one. We started in September. I don't remember the exact first okay. date of the first one. I'm just one. curious. They're having faculty from um, uh, public as well as secondary come in and talk about the standards, and that's why I was curious. No, and it may. Oh, it's a P16 council. Those are the efforts of your councils in that area. Okay. okay. This is where they use the uh, survey tool. Right, mm -hmm. real time survey tool. It was, it was, I went to the one in San Antonio. It was really good. I'm going to stay for the whole time. It was really good. Good. Yeah. First five minutes were. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Judy. Did more than that, for the record. It, did you want to vote on that one? Yeah, we, we have to yeah. vote on each one of them. Okay, any, any discussion or questions, Judy, before we move on to the. Okay, then may I have a motion? I owe you dinner. I'll make the motion. Uh, Brenda, second. Second. Bob Wingo, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Item six. Judy? This is the approval of a grant to purchase services through a contract regarding the model vertical alignment project. Uh, the board staff request approval to enter into a contract with the University of Texas Pan American, Austin Community College, and Cisco College to implement college and career readiness standards alignment and professional development regional, uh, regional projects. This was approved by PNS on June the 22nd. Total cost of the project is $300,000. As you know, part of the College Readiness Initiative requires that we also do professional development of faculties uh, in terms of using this. This is not just information. This is beyond that. And so we hope that uh, through these institutions, the workshops will be conducted, developed and conducted with 24 hours of professional training, tapping into over 700 educators, both secondary and post-secondary. And that is the purpose of this grant and okay. contract. Question? Discussion? Okay. Do we have a uh, motion? Motion to approve. By Bob Wingo, a second? Second. By Brenda, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Next is item seven. Item 7 is the grant to purchase services through a, contact, a contract for testing fees for evaluation purposes regarding the intensive summer program. The funding for the intensive summer program comes to us through 2237 funds from the Texas uh, Education Agency. As part of that contract, we are required to do pre and post testing of those programs that are funded. We have done, we did purchase the services for the the, uh, for the pretest, but because of the size and number of students, we did not have enough money to purchase the post test, which we need to purchase for them to do at the end of their program. It would it would make the contract go over a hundred thousand. In fact, the contract to purchase the pre and post total would have been will be a hundred and twenty. So we're asking for the permission to purchase that additional uh, post testing material that ex will then exceed that hundred thousand dollar contract. We want to approve for one hundred twenty thousand. Yes, sir. And it's broken down so that you can see the cost factor in your uh, report. Any questions? Bob? No. Okay, motion. Bob, Bob Wingo, second? Second. Brenda, all in favor? Aye. Aye, motion carries. Item 8. The next item is the request approval to purchase services through one or more contracts regarding accelerated developmental education course models. Uh, the board staff is requesting approval to contract with three institutions, Amarillo College, Tarrant County College, and Austin Community College, to implement accelerated development education pilot projects. These three institutions have accelerated course-based models that are showing success. 
And this is a way to also address that population of students that is on a borderline, that one step over could be into that total uh, uh, credit-bearing course. And we would like to do this looking at the areas of reading uh, and writing, and also to reference that the three institutions would also be providing a match for the funds. So we would be looking at the three institutions uh, for funding. Total cost is 225000 Individual project costs 75000 I, I, just, we'll have, I just have a question. What is the change on the new hand? There was a typographical oh, error. Okay. It, it, <laughs> yeah. it is a non-substantive non change. Yeah. It, was, okay. it cross reference it. another agenda item. <laughs> 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 You know, what's interesting is you can read these. I can't tell you how many times we read them. I, mean, I can't tell you how many staff read it, and then you don't see it. It's, at some yeah. point, it, it took some It's highlighted else. on the second page. Yeah, it took Dr. Alonso to find it. <laughs> you know, this is a great example of, of how staff is drilling really way down to get each individual student on it, down the road in the pipeline. Uh, you're, you're talking here about working with some looking at the test, the interest test these kids take, some kid may have missed every question in one section. All it takes to get them into regular courses is, you know, give them a two week course in whatever that section is. And this is this is it's like gonna be like a miracle if we can really do some of this stuff. Well and these three institutions are showing success. Yeah, and that's why correct. we want to be able to scale it, but before we do that, we want to work with them this year to see if that is the case because it would affect many students in Texas. Yeah really important. Okay. okay, any discussion? If not, do we have a motion? Come on. Second. Second. All right, Brenda, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We're going to have another miracle, Lynn. <laughs> We've got seven pages to go and 20 minutes to do it. You can do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm Kay. The next item is the consideration of adopting the staff recommendation to purchase services through a contract regarding the Community College Developmental Education Initiative. Uh, the board staff is requesting approval to contract with El Paso Community College for the Community College Developmental uh, Education Initiative. Uh, El Paso will serve as a fiscal agent to award competitive programmatic grants to public two-year institutions across the state. El Paso Community College will solicit input on programmatic projects awarded from the Developmental Education Initiative Policy Team, which is a team that's being led by the Texas Association of Community Colleges, of which Tamara Clunas and Dr. Gardner and someone from Susan Brown's staff is also a member of that team. Funding the programmatic activities will be to address course-based and non-course-based components as determined by the uh, coordinating board staff. This was recommended for approval by participation and success on June 22nd. Uh, I would also, would you like me to explain also the... Please. <laughs> uh, let me explain how we came to this because it's really a very important way to, um, I guess, showing good faith with our colleagues. The original, the $5 million that was awarded to this agency uh, by the legislature for developmental education came to us in a unique way because it came to us through funding that would have gone to the community college in their own appropriation. So the funding was taken from that and <coughs> given to the coordinating board. Uh, in terms of us addressing developmental education with that five million dollar initiative. In conversation, uh, very serious conversation with Tamara and I apologize that Tamara is not here, but she wants to be here tomorrow with a voice. Uh, she's got bronchitis and she's been in bed for two days and so I told her to stay home because tomorrow she will be presenting the full plan. And so we thought that it would be a benefit to work with a community college who already is definitely showing promise, which is the El Paso Community College, in their initiatives with developmental education, even as evidenced by the funding they have received from the Gates Foundation. 
to be the fiscal agent that would help us channel this funding out to projects anywhere from twenty-five to a hundred thousand dollars, projects that are already beginning to do individual small things on their campuses that with some scale-up money they could begin to move forth and see if this is really working. Uh, El Paso Community College will not reap any benefit from this money because they cannot apply for the grant. They will be the they will be the fiscal agents to channel the money out. We cannot contract with the Texas Counseling Association to do this. And so we would like to work with them and like to be able to tap into more institutions out there to also help them with their efforts since our five million will be targeted in a different way. And I don't know, the commissioner may want to add something. Yes, sir. I, I wanted to to say that uh, this program is intended to complement the larger the five million dollar program, which will establish demonstration sites. Uh, this this program is intended to scale up focused, relatively small components of uh, of uh, developmental education on individual campuses. For example. Let's say that uh, Community College X wants uh, $25,000 to provide professional development for their staff teaching developmental ed courses. Then this program will allow funding of that type. If another campus, for example, wants to wants $25,000 to redesign their uh, introductory developmental ed courses in English, uh, this will this will provide funding for that sort of thing. The, the $5 million project uh, is intended to fund institutions that are redesigning developmental education comprehensively from the ground up. And so it's a very different kind of program. This allows us, uh, the, the $5 million uh, sum of money will only fund two or three demonstration projects. This smaller uh, program will allow us to fund virtually every community college in the state that has an innovative approach to developmental education. Sure. Yeah. And I guess, Commissioner Judy, isn't there another three million that we're allocating out of college readiness funds towards development, developmental education? I thought I read that in the board book. Yes. Yes. So there's even more initiatives that we're funding out of this college readiness. Initiative. That's right. We just haven't brought them before you yet because as after you hear the total composite of the plan, then you will see how they will, you know, we will begin to move forward. We're only seeking funding for what's here in the book today. Okay. Thank you. And this, uh, this, uh, uh, these two programs, the $5 million project plus this one, will position us uh, very well to receive foundation support because, and, and U.S. Department of Education support because they would expect a significant matching contribution if they were to fund any projects in Texas. I would also like to add that you will hear her tomorrow morning, but Dr. Patricia Gandara, who has spoken to three different constituent groups here today, said to me this morning when I was bringing her to the coordinating board that she was very impressed with the thoughts and the position and the movement that the coordinating board has taken in developmental education because for them in California, they have not been able to come to the table to build that consensus. And we're even deeper into curriculum looking at the, the value and the improvement of that. We're there at a different level. So she was just she was very complimentary of that work. She uh, had a chance to get some people had asked her questions about that in her discussion. So I thought I'd share that with you. Well, based on the budget shortfalls in California, I think they're cutting across the board, yes. everything. So I, I'm, I'd be surprised if there's much funding available to do anything. In fact, she told us they graduated 145 teachers from UCLA with master's degrees and not one of them could get employment in California. Very critical. Pretty ugly. Yeah. I have a question. Does anybody know if for these uh, the entry level tests uh, at community colleges, if those tests have the computer breakout like like other standardized tests that show the errors in the sections. 
Well, it, it can give you, yes, it can give you an analysis of where your areas are, where your strengths or your weaknesses are, is are if you go into the diagnostic level of the test, yes. Okay. You can I'm achieve that. I'm just thinking that. that that might be some sort of, uh, we might want to uh, look at, a, at, at someone who wants to take that information and do something creative with it. Compass, I know, for, uh, does that, and you can need, then go into the diagnostic part, taking a student through that level, and then putting them through programmed instruction to then go back and pre- and post-test them. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the AccuPlacer, which is the most widely used a tool for placement in developmental ed mm -hmm. in community colleges in Texas, is being significantly revised right. with a much stronger diagnostic Excellent. component, and I have offered uh, to the college board that Texas could be the test site oh, for because uh, that would probably be the one thing that would do this speed up absolutely. that you want more than absolutely. anything else. Uh, Evie Hyatt and of course Tamara Clunas have been uh, working in dialogue and, and in contact with the commissioner on AccuPlacer. In fact, we did some field testing for them a few months back. They wanted to do pre and post testing uh, as they uh, totally changed their, their program. Great. I, uh, I have a quick thought about developmental ed that just occurred to me, and I'm wondering if maybe we could look into it, um, or maybe maybe you all already know the answer to this, but you know, the, the, the students that graduate from high school don't come in neat little packages that started in one school district in pre-K and gone all the way you know, through the system and graduated, and now they're not ready for college, or they are. They're, they're kids that have come from various um, countries, various states, various school districts. I'm wondering if we could look at the data and see which students are, are needing developmental ed. Are they students that have just come here to this state? Are they, are they students that have come from another country? Are they students, um, you know, I, I'm wondering if we've kind of placed, I, I'm not going to use the word blame, but placed a responsibility on a particular high school thinking you aren't graduating students who are college ready when in fact these kids have only been in that particular school in this state, in this country for a short period of time. And I hadn't thought about that before. Well, a, a large percentage of the students in community colleges who require developmental education have been out of school a while. Been, have so, been what? Have been out of school out of for school a while. while. So right. You're, you're right that it's, it's not just, it's not uh, high schools that are the uh, the root of the of the problem because uh, uh, so many students I forget David you know the numbers better than I what percentage of uh, community college students come from uh, some time out of school well it's about half and half so that's sixty percent back here it's about half and half. but won't the pathways models kind of help us the with the pathways this? model will help a lot that right that's a good point. Tamara has also been working with Susan Brown's staff to try and disaggregate that population to see the difference with the ABEs, vice versa. And I think, too, is although tax is certainly not the measure of college readiness, but with the new end of course and the new changes with the with House Bill three, then you may be able to look more closely, you know, at at what is the implications in terms of what has happened. Plus, you'll be able to also look at students up to by 11th grade and know who is college ready and what needs to be done to intervene to help them. Right. So. Okay. Any other any discussion questions? Okay. If not, we have a motion. So moved by Bob. Second. Seconded by Brenda. I believe. Uh, L is next, is it not? Uh, yes, sir. Please? The next item is a grant to purchase services through a contract regarding Master College Readiness Special Advisors. And this is uh, the board staff requests funding to contract with 10 institutions of higher ed to utilize their current concept of the Master College Readiness Special Advisor to offer presentations on college and career readiness to statewide and regional groups and to work with regional institutions of higher education faculty who are involved in the collaborative that we have funded under the educator quality model. The PNS committee approved this on June 22, 2009. This would expand our regional meetings because then this individual could then continue to go out and do meetings beyond just the ones that we uh, are going to have scheduled. So we're trying to cover a larger base with the help of these trained advisors. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, Judy, if I may, 
I want to digress for a second. On our last vote, uh, we got a motion and a second, but we didn't have a vote. Oh, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Now we move to item L. I'm trying to Are read you your five minutes. With that? <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Pardon? Are you complete? Yes, I Item am. L, I okay. Am. So then we need a motion here as well. So moved. <clears throat> By Bob and second. Second. By Brenda, all in favor? Aye. aye. Motion carries. And just let me just, because I track the dollars and I have my financial reporting package now. The, the $2,009 are one point one. That is correct. And then the rest of that balance is it's for two, the next ten, five million. Yeah. That is correct. Okay. The next item is a purchase of services through a contract regarding the pre-service practicum induction and in-service project that we currently have. Uh, and the board staff is requesting funding to extend and amend the contract that we have with the Charles Dana Center for an additional two years of the biennium to continue expanding the partnership with the University of Texas at Brownsville and Texas Southern University. The funding will provide resource for staff support at the Dana Center, staff and faculty support at the two universities, and the licensing fees for the online tools. Uh, this project, uh, of course, a continuation will be satisfactory completion of the project up to this point. The breakdown of the amounts of funds are at the top of your page. We did provide them with $600,000 over 2007-2009. We are looking at a two-year funding in the amount of $425,000 each year for a total contract award of $1,450,000. Discussion? <clears throat> Questions? If not, may I have a motion? I'll make, the, have a motion. I'll make the motion. Okay, by Brenda, a second yes. by Bob. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Hellenfeld's your other voting member. <laughs> hey, we're down to the very bold forum, right? Okay, item in. The next yeah. item is for the Centers for Teacher Education. It's the recommendation for a grant to purchase services. This is a grant that comes through Rider 17. It is funded to the coordinating board. It is the money that is distributed to the TADC School, Texas Association of Developing Colleges. The total project cost is $6,331,484. Each year, each institution is awarded $1.266,296. It is for the advancement of educator preparation at those institutions, meeting the standard of performance of the state, including the connection of technology. So moved. Moved by Bob. Second. Second by Brenda. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Next item is O. Board staff is requesting a 12-month extension and additional funding be provided for four of the five two uh, second cycle of the Math, Science, Technology, Teacher Preparation Academies. The four institutions of higher education include Stephen F. Austin, the University of Texas at Arlington, Texas A&M University at Corpus Christi, and Texas State University at San Marcos. The Participation and Success Committee approved this on June 22nd. The total contract amount is $2,927,000. The amount of funds uh, coming from 2009 are $1,177,000. And the total, the, the total contract of $1,177,000. So that's how we get to the $2,927,000. Let me also say that of the Four of the five institutions who currently have that cycle funding, UTEP is the only one that is not seeking funding, and that is because if they seek that continuation rollover money, then they're not eligible to apply for the fourth cycle of funding. So they have elected not to ask for the continuation of funds. <clears throat> this is also money that comes through 2237, uh, college readiness under the math science technology. Okay. Motion. <clears throat> Motion by Bob. Second. Second by Brenda. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. 
Next item is P, is it Paul? Okay, Darla. She just the floor. Yeah, these, this is this item is just to add the uh, cost of the data center services into the interagency contract with DIR for fiscal years ten and eleven. So it's mandated for House Bill 1516, the data center consolidation and the <coughs> state um, consolidation project for IBM to provide services. And, and those are the specific amounts we're, man yes. we're appropriate. Those are the estimated amounts. Yeah. Uh, we Our billing is currently coming in a little bit under that, but okay. these are the items, the costs that are required to add to the interagency contract. But it's all based on unit costs, so they vary every month. Questions, discussion? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. <clears throat> motion by Brenda. Second. Second. By Bob. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is uh, Q. This is request for qualifications or pr uh, proposals uh, for. Request for purchase of services. Item number one is a request for applications regarding the P16 councils for fiscal year 2010. Grant ranging from 30 to 50,000. Total project cost is 850,000. It was presented to PNS and approved on June 22nd. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Will this be to support new councils or new and it could. existing councils? No, it could be existing and new councils. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other question or discussion? Motion? Fred? I'm back. I'll make a motion. It's your turn. <laughs> Move approval, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Second. Bye, Bob. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. For giving you a hard time, Fred. <laughs> I think you're giving Bob a hard time. <laughs> Next item is hard the Fred. Joe Bob. <laughs> I'm trying to keep to your time, and we're all right, that's up. Okay. Request for applications regarding the work study mentorship program. This is use of fiscal funds 2010 2011 in the amount of $5 million. Grant sizes can range from 30000 to 300000 We are requesting approval to let out the RFA for these projects. It is estimated that 40 institutions of higher education will be selected for funding for a total of 1,000 collegiate G-Force members each year of the biennium. The Participation and Success Committee approved this project on June the 22nd, 2009. This funding comes to us through the legislature in order to implement the program. Question? Bob? No questions. Motion? Okay. Bob, second? Second. Uh, Brenda, all in favor? Aye. Uh, motion carries. <clears throat> Item number three is a request for applications regarding the intensive programs. This money is ranges in the amount from three to nine million dollars. This is shared with the Math Science Teacher Academies. <clears throat> Average project cost is two hundred thousand. It is money that is MOU from TEA to the Coordinating Board, uh, specific for this area. Approval was granted by the PNS Committee on June the twenty second, and we are asking approval to put be able to release the RFAs. And of course, you would of course be notified who ultimately is the recipient of awards. Correct. Right. Okay. Question. Motion. Move approval. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. So I bring all in favor. Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Item four. The next item is a request for application regarding the developmental education demonstration demonstration project. Funding, of course, is coming from the legislature in the amount of five million dollars. It would go over the biennium of 2010-2011. We are seeking applications for no more than three to four awards across the state that would take all of the elements as listed here on your second page, which are already identified from best practices, and putting them into one system. 
And so we are looking to try and fund three to four systems that would totally redesign and incorporate these elements within their developmental education program. We would also then uh, retain money in terms of that marketing, that evaluation, and that scalability, and this is how we are proposing to use the $5 million. Extensive evaluation and detail evaluation will be done so that by the end of the first year, we will have information to move forth as we go into the next legislative preparation. Discussion? Yeah, uh, Judy, I think you just, uh, you know, at least in part answered the question I was going to ask, which is how quickly can we uh, identify these three to four awards since uh, we really, if, it's, if they're going to want to know the results over an academic year, the only one we've got is the one that starts here in a few weeks. The RFA is ready to go. Uh, we just need your approval to finish the routing and to get it out next month so that we can award a, a contract in September and or move it so that you will know who at your October board meeting uh, has been successful at, or have been successful because we are seeking for three to four. And it may be only three, but it will be the best so that we know that yeah. we can move forward. And would it likely be community colleges or? It's community college systems, yes. But that would be already doing these things and are? It may, it may be. No one is doing it all together in one right. place. And I guess so what I'm driving at is will we get a full academic year's results when we're not actually awarding it until we're six weeks into the... Well, you, when you think about it, if it's awarded in September, of course you would have missed the cohort in September, but you don't miss the cohort in January. You don't miss any cohort coming in at summer, and you certainly would be able to garner the fall because they start school in August. So it would be, we could be able to see what has happened uh, with their program of implementation from those students who came through it, even though they might have been tested this fall, uh, but coming into January, so there there could be two semesters of work. I don't think there's there. any way they could go back and, and, and grab this coming fall's cohort, even though they're starting. That's what I'm saying. They would have this fall's cohort, and based on how quickly they can move forward, that some of that cohort may be affected by what they implement. Because this, this, this is going to be really under the spotlight in the next legislature. Yeah. It's one of the most well, and these institutions will be in the spotlight because of their need to yeah. to do what we have asked, and that is to take and do systemically what individual pockets may be existing out there. Well, I move approval so we don't hold you up any longer. Second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. But just a quick, Jeannie, could we put in the RFP to, to ask them to be willing to go back and grab the... That, the August yes. cohort? That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Specify it so they know what Anything that will help enhance the, the usability and the success of what they're doing. Yeah. That's a great idea, Lynn. The next Is item, it? and I think I'm finished after that, will be the math, <laughs> math science teacher. Uh, you will be finished. Yes, I will have finished. It will be the Math Science uh, Technology Teacher Academies. We are seeking funding for a fourth cycle. Uh, utilizing the funds to uh, secure more uh, programs out in the field with a, depending on the funds available after we look at the intense, the summer programs or the academic year programs that we're trying to implement. If we had four million dollars, it would allow us to have eight more institutions of higher education out there preparing math science uh, master degree teachers as well as pre-service teachers completing that if we had eight million, then we could do 16. So since we share the funding, it will just depend on how we can make that money stretch. And this money, of course, is 2237 money coming from TEA to us. Okay. Any discussion? If not, we'll have a motion. So moved. Motion by Bob. Second. Second. Uh, Fred, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. I would also like to thank the committee because it was, and I think uh, Mrs. Bricker alluded to it, it was because of your insight that we went back and modified and provided the detail that we've had in, in these reports to AOC, and it certainly has helped us as a staff better look at what we're saying and what we're asking you for, so I thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Judy. Next item on the agenda is... Uh, 
to go into closed section. The Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board Committee on Agency Operations will hold a closed executive session to seek or to receive its attorney's advice pursuant to Texas Government Code ANN dot section 551-0712. On the following matter, including a consultation with the attorney regarding the issuance of refunding and, and, and defiance defiant, defiant of the uh, State of Texas College Student Loan Bonds and related issues pursuant to Section 551.0712, Texas Government Code, ANN 1, period. This uh, matter to be addressed is uh, consideration of approval of a request for qualifications regarding bond, tax legal counsel to perform legal services for the agency. Upon adjournment of the executive session, the committee will also take a motion on the request for qualification regarding bond slash tax legal counsel to perform legal services for the agencies. May I have your approval to go into executive session? Bob? Second. Second. By Brenda, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Now, we will announce the time we're going into executive session at 4.09. And upon returning to, to the regular committee meeting, I'll announce the uh, time when we uh, will resume. Okay, so we will now move to executive committee meeting. Yeah, I know. Got to get them over there. Oh, wait. <laughs> Sit down. Okay, we're going to uh, arise from the closed session meeting <coughs> at exactly 4.44. And so we will resume our meeting. And uh, <coughs> the discussion now will have a motion for consideration of approval of a request for qualifications regarding bond tax legal counsel to perform legal services for the agency. I'll make the motion. Second. Brenda makes a motion. Bob seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. This concludes the uh, Agency Operations Committee meeting. Do I have a motion to conclude? Motion. Uh, Bob? Second. Brenda seconds.